while most New York politicos don't wear their pop culture preferences on their sleeves, State Senator Mike Gineris likes to wear his on his face, routinely rocking a face mask emblazoned with the Rebellion Forces logo from the Star Wars series, which earned the blessing of Luke Skywalker himself on Twitter. In light of these credentials, we're chatting with the Queen's Democrat about Star Wars for the latest Poozer pop culture segment. You ready to do this, Senator? I'm ready. I'm ready, Dave. Excellent. So how did your relationship with Star Wars begin? <laughs> I was I was there from the beginning, so to speak. I was a kid when uh, the original movie came out and fell in love with it. Uh, like so many of my generation, the original uh, trilogy uh, is the gold standard and stuck with it through the years. They, they keep driving content out there and I keep eating it up like so many others. Right. So you were seven when the first movie came out, 10 when the second one, and 13 uh, when Return of the Jedi came out. Was there something about being that age that made you, you think, susceptible to this sci-fi Western adventure? It was, um, my, my memory is it was just so mind-blowing right from the get, right? The first thing you see is such a mind-blowing concept. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, right? It's the first interaction anyone has with Star Wars film. And just pause and think about that for a second. You're dealing with something that seems so futuristic in terms of the technology and science fiction that's involved, but it's telling you it happened a long, long time ago because that can't happen. <laughs> the galaxy, the universe is that is that old. Um, and so it immediately just gets you thinking about concepts in ways that uh, you usually don't. Um, and then from there, just the whole story, the way it was modeled kind of on uh, on Western, but took it in, in a completely different direction. George Lucas gives a lot of credit. Whether you agree with what he did in the in the prequels or not, or, or what's happened with it afterwards, he forever uh, deserves a spot in the Hall of Fame for coming up with the original concept. Well, it's one thing to be swept away with Star Wars A New Hope at seven and just really reveling in, in the childlike wonder of it. But by the time Return of the Jedi came out, like I said, you're 13. There's got to be some other interests, maybe girls. So did you find that your fandom maybe had cooled a, a little bit? Maybe it wasn't as cool to be uh, a fan of uh, lightsabers and, and stuff? Or were you still an unabashed fan? H- have you seen Princess Leia's outfit in Return of the Jedi? I think <laughs> in- interest of girls is not dispositive with interest in Star Wars at that point. But no, I never, I never really, I never really lost uh, interest in it. It was just, it was fascinating. It was so much a part of my upbringing. You know, I love, I love a good epic. And then when additional stories started coming out, first the prequels, which, you know, weren't perfect, but it kept the story moving. Some really great characters in there uh, as well. Uh, then followed up with the, some of the animated uh, series, which, which I ate up as well, the Clone Wars and then Rebels. And finally the sequels, which, you know, they still got some work to do there, but Star Wars is versatile. And now that they've moved uh, to streaming and more of the series model, uh, I'm hoping that they do some work to patch up the uh, the sequels as well. Well, at the end of 2019, you on Twitter ranked Rogue One as your favorite Star Wars film. And I want to thank you for that brave take because I really love this movie, but I don't know if I'm brave enough to do something as crazy as rank it number one. Uh, why is it number one for you? It definitely is. It's, it's gritty. It's realistic. It's doesn't really have uh, any plot holes that I can see. I mean, a lot of the other movies, you kind of scratch your head about some of the holes that were left in there, but this is just, a, it's a band of rebels who um, are fighting before the victory is in sight. And, you know, all the best movies end with the main characters dying at the end. So there, there you have it in Rogue One. They just, you grow to love them, you grow to appreciate them, and they all sacrifice themselves. Um, and of course, the single uh, best Darth Vader scene uh, of all time when uh, he gets on that ship and, and slaughters the rebels uh, with the ferocity you, know, you haven't seen from, from his character in some of the other movies. But all packaged together, it was just a really nice way to tie, tie the, the movies up. Well, I have to admit, I am also a sucker for that final end of the movie with uh, Darth Vader just cutting through rebels and even uh, a CGI version of young Leia all works for me. But some people argue that it's kind of too fan servicey and that it's a deviation from a movie that, like you say, is really grounded in these uh, stories that seem plausible and realistic and these characters who all perish and they're kind of unique characters. Were you, 
do you feel at all like that was uh you know just too much of uh the nostalgia mas- machine with, with the, well, the end of that movie? as a fan i'm never going to complain about fan service but i would i would argue that's the problem with a lot of the sequels where um there's just gratuitous fan service in there that's not connected to the story. In Rogue One, everything that was in there had relevance. Uh, there wasn't a lot that was wasted in terms of uh, Easter eggs or, or or what have you. It was it, it all made sense. It all was there for a purpose. And then for those of us who had seen some of these characters in uh, the lesser known Star Wars content, uh, the the animated series mostly, you see you know Saw Gerrera come to life in Forrest Whitaker. I mean, those are those are great moments. Well, speaking of animated characters coming to life, I've really enjoyed getting to see Ahsoka Tano on the big screen. Well, I guess the TV screen, depending on how big your home TV is, as well as uh, Cad Bane in in the Boba Fett series. Is there any character that was uh, portrayed or created in the cartoons that you're really excited to see in live action? Or are the two I mentioned kind of some of the big ones for you? Well, the two plus Saul Guerrero, which I mentioned, are, are three of the are three of the big ones. Um, I think you know in the Ahsoka series that's coming up, we're hopefully going to get to see uh, an Ezra Bridger character come to life. And for those less knowledgeable, uh, Ezra was kind of the main <laughs> character in the, in the Rebels animated series, um, and it seems that Ahsoka's search for him, because he kind of gets lost at the end of the uh, series, spoiler alert, may well be what her series is about. So we may get to see him as well as uh, General Thrawn, who's the main villain in the character. So I think there's still some more great animated characters to come. You're a defender of the controversial Star Wars The Last Jedi film, writing on Twitter that uh, you're into Star Wars because of, quote, the characters, their conflicts, and how they're interrelated to one another, adding that The Last Jedi hit all those marks. Why do you think so many Star Wars fanboys rejected the eighth movie in the Skywalker series? Every Star Wars production is incredibly controversial, what I've come to learn. Some people love them, some people hate them, and these are fans. It's a highly charged fan base, but I think people need to like let go just a little bit and enjoy what it is. And What Last Jedi was about to be was like an intricate relationship. I know even Mark Hamill, even he was a little bit critical of how they treated his character, but I thought it was great. The fact that Luke turned into a grumpy old man, disillusioned with the universe and had to be re-inspired by, by Ray and, and the younger generation, I thought was a great part of the story. It was interesting. It wasn't just, you know, Luke the hero running around saving the world. Even that conversation he has uh, with the force ghost of, uh, of Yoda uh, by the tree was really poignant. And for someone in my generation, they were talking about passing the torch and it just had a lot of significance uh, for me and and just the effects were amazing and the, the battle on crate was really kind of unique it's hard to come up with new things all the time and with so much so many movies and series and stories around star wars i thought what they did uh, on that planet was really cool the way the salt was covering the red third of the planet it was just really enjoyable movie for me whether other people liked it or not i saw on twitter that you gave away your Star Wars action figures years ago. Do you remember what you had and, and why you parted ways? Yeah, I had all of the uh, original trilogy action figures. The usual, you know, Han Solo, Leia, Luke, Darth, all of, the whole gang, Boba Fett, of course. Um, and I got old. It was like a brief period of my life in between the original trilogy and the prequels coming out where I thought, you know, I guess Star Wars was over, right? There was many years, like 20 years where mm-hmm. there was nothing. Uh, and I, that's the point where I had reached a certain age. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is, uh, I'm not going to be carrying dolls around with me anymore. And so I gave them to my younger cousin, who, when I last checked with him, I think they vanished somehow into the world years ago. So Unfortunate, uh, but you know, part of life, I suppose. Somewhere, there's a bunch of action figures that hopefully some kid is enjoying. What was your reaction to the trailer for the Obi-Wan Kenobi limited series that comes out uh, in late May? I'm excited. May 25th. And we didn't even mention the Grand Inquisitor, who's another animated character that's coming coming to life in that um, in that series. So I'm kind of upset it's only six episodes from what I gather, so it's going to come and go pretty quickly, but I think it's going to be great. Looking very much forward to it. And one thing I will say, apparently he doesn't make an appearance, but I think a good test of level of Star Wars fandom is knowledge about Darth Maul. <laughs> And so most people who've seen the movies, they see that he gets sliced in half, kind of in the episode one, The Phantom Menace, and like, well, there goes Darth Maul, great character, short life. 
but the true fan knows that he lives on. He somehow came back from that and uh, made a very brief cameo at the end of the solo movie. Um, appears frequently in the in the animated series, including an epic fight with Obi Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. But sounds like they went with uh, Darth Vader as the main villain of this upcoming series rather than uh, reintroducing us to Darth Maul. Yeah, I think that's probably for the best since the Darth Maul storyline, especially as how it involves Obi Wan Kenobi, is. is just almost perfect. And you can never get enough Darth Vader content, so it's all good. Well, finally, when you think back to the Republic period, do you think you would have been a good member of the Galactic Senate? Do you think you would have uh, opted not to maybe empower uh, Chancellor Palpatine with uh, unlimited powers? That's the funny thing about wearing the uh, rebel mask in the, in the Senate, on, the, on our actual Senate floor. When Mark Hamill and I got it back and forth on Twitter, like we were joking about whether there was sympathy for the rebellion in the Senate, uh, which is a theme throughout the movies. I think in my time in, in public service, my time in the Senate, I've clearly staked out ground that I'm not afraid to stand up to the uh, the empires of our time, whether it's Andrew Cuomo or, or anybody else. So I think I've been consistent with my belief system and uh, do my best to make the people I represent proud. So you see yourself as like a Bail Organa, Jimmy Smith type? That's an interesting thought. I hadn't, haven't given that much thought. Um, you know, growing up, Luke was always a hero, but he wasn't, of course, a politician. He was just a, a rebel. But yeah, I can see that. Interesting. He's a little bit more of an elder statesman than I fancy myself, but <laughs> along those lines. Well, I hate to break it to you, but if you turn around, I think you're probably the same age that Jimmy Smith might have been in those prequels, if not older. It's- I know, it's happening, Dave, it's happening. So maybe you're right. <laughs> well, we've been speaking with State Senator Mike Gianaris. Senator, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasureful experience, Dave. Thanks so much. Capital Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected.